ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the webinar. Today's webinar topic is incentivizing key personnel with equity alternatives. Our presenters today are attorneys Gary Forrester and Catherine Jones. If you'd like a copy of the presentation, please see the handout section of the webinar interface. There's also a firm brochure in there for you. Without further ado, let me turn it over to our presenters. Gary, Catherine, go ahead. Hello, thanks for attending. Um, we're Forster Bowman. We're a uh, tax and corporate boutique in uh, Greater Orlando, and we're going to take today present a means of incentivizing uh, employees to stay with the employer without the encumbrances of a stock option or similar type agreement. We have a, a number of business clients. We we focus on business and tax work, both domestic and international. And from time to time, an owner, typically an owner of a, of a smaller mid-sized group, uh, will want to incentivize an employee to stay with the company for the long term without having to issue equity. For instance, if um, the company is family owned or, or very privately owned um, and they have a, a, a superstar salesperson or this type of thing, uh, they really want a means by which the person can benefit from driving the profits of the firm, driving the stability of the firm, being a valuable employee without really having to pay them anything until sale of the company. Um, so we're, today we're going to talk about some of the alternatives to issuing equity or a stock option plan. I'm going to turn it over to Catherine Jones, who's our firm corporate guru in general, to give you an overview. <laughs> Thanks, Gary, and thank you all for joining us this afternoon. I, we're going to start with uh, just a topical overview of what we're going to be covering today. Um, we are really just looking at a general discussion of broad concepts. We're not going to be covering the details of the nitty gritty on a granular, granular level. So tax securities or regulatory issues are really beyond the scope of this seminar, but we may follow up if there's interest with a uh, more detailed look at those potential issues. Or if you have a question. Or if you have a question, feel free to you know uh, mention it or um, send us an email. The, uh, the next uh, broad topic is some basic terminology that we'll use throughout the presentation. And then from there, we're just gonna go into the basics, the what, the who and the why uh, behind these equity alternative plans, the hows and the wins, We'll make some closing remarks and have some anecdotes of some recent uh, deals that we've done with um, with the uh, the Phantom unit pl plan in place, and then some Q and A at the end. For basic terminology, we'll refer to the the employees or the service providers who are receiving benefits under the plan as participants. The company is the issuing entity, such as an employer, or it doesn't have to be a, a, a standard employer. It could be a, a independent contractor relationship between the service provider and the recipient. There are uh, two different variations of equity alternative plans that we'll discuss today. One is the phantom plan, and one is the equity appreciation rights plan. These two different plans generally follow the same structure, except for uh, what the the participant is going to be receiving upon change of control. So a phantom plan uh, is a full value benefit, whereas the equity appreciation rights is a benefit based on the growth of the company or the appreciation um, from a certain point in time up into a sale or change of control transaction. So a phantom plan is basically like issuing equity to the employee. It, they basically enjoy a percentage interest in the company. It, it actually would dilute um, all the actual equity holders in the event of a change of control or if you're issuing income to phantom holders in the event of a dividend type distribution. Um, so it's a it's kind of a one for one plan. Um, we And by the way, we refer to these pl as plans and the format of these uh, phantom or equity appreciation rights plans can either be, if you have, for instance, only one or two employees, it can just be in the form of a contract where someone just is is issued this right to income either during when in, when distributions are made or upon a change of control of the company or you can actually do a whole plan in other words if you have 5 10 20 people that you want to 
create a, an incentive to stay with the company. You can create a plan document, which is something like, you know, something like your 401k plan in a way. And then these employees that you choose can join the plan. And so they, there's a plan document that they read and they basically sign a two page, what is it? Two or three page piece of paper right. where they join. Short. Right. And mm -hmm. then you show them on the piece of paper, how much of the phantom plan at what percentage or what you how many units they'll be issued. So you can do a contract or you can do actual plan document. And what's interesting about the difference between the phantom plan, which is just like stock and equity appreciation is on equity appreciation, you're saying to the employee, well, we're not going to give you a percentage. What we're going to do is we're going to just give you a percentage of the increase in value. So we're relying on you to help us mm -hmm. raise the value of the company. And here's the percentage of that difference we're going to give you. So it's pure motivation based on day one. If they can be part of a rising tide, they're going to get a piece. Thanks, Gary. We referred to a change in control, um, and we'll talk more about this later, but this is really the triggering event that would give rise to the company's obligation to pay plan benefits. And um, later in the seminar, we'll discuss what those events typically were, were usually asked to draft, And uh, but it's really a creature of contract where it's whatever the company feels is appropriate for their facts and circumstances. Uh, we talk about awards, that's a grant, of phantom or ear units and that's again it's not equity it's a contractual right to receive some payment and then continuous services is what we're going to refer to as what the participant has to do to receive the payment upon change in control and what basically again we're trying to incentivize retention and growth so they would have to be maintaining some level of service to be eligible to receive the payout upon change in control next we're moving on to the what uh, it's probably best just to go into what it's not. Um, they're not true ownership interests in the company. So they're not shares in a corporation or units in an LLC. This is not uh, ownership in the sense that they have a piece of the company. There's no voting. There's no voting. Um, we're going to get into some right. particular equity rights. Exactly. Yeah. So because they're not owners of the company, they're not going to receive tax allocations of the company for uh, tax purposes. So there's, they're not going to receive K-1s. The tax benefits and burdens are reserved to the true equity holders. <clears throat> the only exception to that would be on some of these, it's not that common anymore with the phantom or the, the E or EAR um, rights is that they could get a distribution if the if you want to incentivize the employee to share in annual profits part of that uh, that non-equity participation right could be a percent of the profits and if in fact they get a percent of the profits it will be taxed to them as an employee and they could be issued a k-1 it's i think it depends on the circumstances mm -hmm. if they're an employee it would just come out as w-2 wages um but there there can be a link to the earnings of the company, if that's what you want to do. Typically, it really has to do with an event. Like we're going to work until we get to a point where we can sell the company and that's when you're going to get paid. Uh, a second key distinction between the participants of a plan and the true equity owners is voting rights. The participants in an equity alternative plan don't have the right to participate in the management of the company uh, nor the right to vote, which may in some circumstances be conferred upon um, the owners of the company via a statute. So in Florida, we have um, the center's rights, which are triggered upon certain events like a merger or a reorg. Um, and true equity owners would have certain rights to vote, to approve or disapprove that event, and then also to receive a fair value for payment of their equity interests. Participants, because they're not owners, don't receive those rights under the statutes. Uh, perhaps more practical is uh, the statutory rights to inspect and copy company records. Those are rights that are conferred upon true owners of the company. So we've listed in the, the materials some statutory sites in Florida for these inspection rights for LLCs, corporations, and partnerships. Um, a key thing to remember is that this can be really cumbersome on the company to comply with these records requests. 
And um, although there are defenses available to kind of limit the scope of production, um, really the best defense is just to not have the rights conferred to begin with. And, and so um, one of the concerns that we see in practice is if you have, if you issue true equity to even a very small ownership percentage, um, that person won't have the same rights as somebody that holds a majority um, yes. to inspect and copy records. There's a lot of encumbrance associated with issuing actual equity. Obviously, if, if we have an employee who's on a non-equity plan and they're not properly paid, you, you can get into an argument, you can get into complaints, you can get into litigation. And as part of that litigation, uh, demands for accounting can be made. But there's a relevancy issue there. In other words, there's going to be a particular issue and the accounting associated with that particular issue may be disclosed and it may not be very harmful. But when you get into actual equity, you're going to, you're, the business owner is going to be subject to disclosure pursuant to that statute. And that statute is going to be, is in most states, very broad. Um, so it's not like, oh, we didn't pay, we, he missed it by 5%, we made a mistake. It's, I want to see all your books and records now. And you could object to that if they're, if they're not equity owners. But if they're equity owners, you're going to be subject to a very, very broad disclosure requirement, which you really want to avoid. And then uh, there's also some exposure there to an adverse attorney's fees award if, you know, oh, sure. there, uh, there's a finding that the company improperly uh, failed to comply with the request. And our litigators get this all the time. I mean, this is, you know, a very time consuming endeavor um, mm -hmm. to respond and defend. These are the diff those are the different right. formats. Right, those are the of, different formats of the statute. business entity. Mm -hmm. that they all have it. Uh, the what, what it's not, it's not a funded plan. So there's no set aside of company assets or requirement to actually um, mm -hmm. fund the plan until a change in control then occurs. So there aren't any liquidity issues created upon the adoption of the plan or the granting of awards. It has no bank account. It has no guarantee in it like you would a deferred compensation, like a, 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 a regulated deferred compensation plan. It's simply a promise to pay if an event occurs. It, what's interesting about the promise um, is it it does become a debt. A lot of a lot of clients we have to educate on this. They don't realize that it actually does become a debt of the business. Mm -hmm. So it's not like it, you can't really play around with it from 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 a from an exposure issue. If you have a change of control, you're going to have to pay this out. Um, of course, we're going to get into and Catherine's going to get into some detail on well, when does the employee lose his or her rights to the change of control money, the distributions, the dividends? How does that happen? And what are the, what are the standards? Because you, what's, what's good and bad about um, non-equity participation plans is that you make the rules. So it's kind of like an LLC. We came up, we, we have LLCs now and they have operating agreements and people are making their own LLCs. The problem is it's not like a corporation where, you know, you've got, you've got statutes governing every step of the way uh, between the owners and the officers and directors. With LLCs, you kind of make your own thing. And um, because, you, because you create your own situation similar to a non-equity participation plan, you've got to really have your I's dotted and your T's crossed. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about what it is. And Gary alluded to this earlier. It is, in the simplest form, a contractual right to receive a payment upon the occurrence of a specified event, provided that the eligibility conditions that are set forth in the plan are satisfied. And we'll get to that a little bit later, but typically if an employee leaves, um, they forfeit the, that right. They, they need to be uh, employed or providing services at the time of the change in control. And this really, uh, again, is designed to incentivize retention and uh, maintaining those key people in positions where they can help the company grow. Uh, the payout of the plan is um, one of the drawbacks from the employee's perspective mm -hmm. is, is the tax treatment of the payout of the plan benefits, and that is compensation. 
uh, tax as ordinary income. So uh, we get this a lot, you know, um, and really, again, because it's, it's, it's comp, um, the potential workaround is to, to do a gross up payment from the company to help offset the, the potentially increased yeah, tax okay. liability. Um, but again, there's, you know, because it's not a true, it's not an option plan in the traditional sense, uh, there would not be capital gains treatment upon um, to, the, to the participant employee. It's also much more open because it's not an option plan. It's more right. flexible. It's not subject to all the Internal Revenue Code rules, the participation rules. You know, you can't have you can't have certain equity holders involved in the stock option plan. Um, also, in some ways, in some ways, it's more beneficial to the owner mm -hmm. because we take it. The owner takes it. We typically represent the owner. The owner takes it as a deduction. It's just it's just compensation payable. It's fully deductible. Um, although the employee, it's not quite as attractive because they've got to pay ordinary income rates as opposed to capital gains rates. Moving on to the who and the why. Uh, again, typically we're asked to design plans to incentivize key executive or managerial personnel who aren't already founders or owners of the company. Uh, it really could be whoever the company wants to incentivize and retain. So it could be staff level or uh, technical employees. And I think particularly in the IT context or engineering or uh, industries where um, that enterprise knowledge is really important. Um, you want to keep the people uh, incentivized to stay and also um, just to grow the knowledge base of the company. And then also new executives. Um, there may be a situation where a company wants to bring in an outside CEO, uh, but they're not, they're not ready to uh, bring them on as a full owner. So this could be kind of a way to bridge that gap to see, you know, see, uh, how this person is going to work within the company without actually extending true ownership at, from the get-go. Yeah, and we've seen in a number of these in the last several months that really the, the young executive or the salesperson, really that's what they want. They want a piece of the pie if there's a sale. There's been so much sale activity. They're working toward a sale. They're working toward a change of control or some type of merger, and this kind of satisfies them in general. Um, and it's not that exposing because if the person – doesn't raise the values in terms of an EAR, uh, or or it doesn't work out employment-wise, it, it evaporates. You don't have to go through this gyration of buyout mm -hmm. provisions. There's no, you know, a lot of times what happens on a on a true equity situation is that there's an argument over value. So we want, you know, it didn't work out. You were terminated or you left. We're buying you back out now because you have to kind of, in general, you you have to typically buy somebody back out of, of uh, actual equity. There's a valuation of that equity, and there's an argument, and there's litigation. Here, it just kind of evaporates. Um, that being said, there are there we've come across, you know, a, a savvy. The more savvy the employee, the more questions they're going to have the less right the company's gonna have to pull this away from them. Um, typically, if they leave and it's not their fault or you force them out somehow, maybe they have the right to be paid out. Um, if they're terminated, not for cause, they might have the right. If they leave and it's not voluntary, if they leave and for some reason, you know, their manager has been abusive or there's some kind of situation like this, you may have to actually buy them out. That really is very rare, though, with these uh, uh, non-equity participation plans, because you know people people tend to move around, and it just kind of evaporates, and then the rest of the people participating continue, and they all toward try to work toward that end goal, that end sale, that end transaction. Mm -hmm. And so um, here's a little summary of the why we we talked about long-term growth and employee retention and i think number two is, is kind of key um is that you're really you're mimicking the economic rights of equity ownership without the potential baggage of voting rights record inspection rights and um you know from the employee's perspective they may just care about the economic rights they may not care usually so much they about just care about it right right so it's a, it's a way to kind of uh reconcile these you know potentially differing viewpoints 
again, we talked about um, kind of who we represent for the most part. We do a lot of work for closely held business owners and they may want to keep the equity in the family or they want to limit ownership to uh, uh, some key founders. And this is a way to incentivize people who may not be within that particular group. And, be, and before they meet us, sometimes people promise stock <laughs> to these employees. Yeah. Don't do this. Don't do this. this is a huge mistake. We've had to work out several of these. It's so much better just to create a phantom plan because these employees are angry. They've left and they, they still have stock because they haven't sold it back. You know, you have no right to buy them out really if you don't have a document. So the stock's floating around. Meanwhile, you know, the company's grown tenfold and it's, it's a, it's a seven month process to get rid of these mm -hmm prior employees that, that, you know, basically were there for the first six months of the company's life. This non-equity stuff so much better because it just goes away if they leave. Yeah. Uh, number five on this slide, uh, we talk about a clean break. And I think that goes to Gary's comment is that you, you know, when somebody leaves, you want it to be as clean of a break as possible. You don't want to be dragged into a, a long buyout or litigation or arguments. So, when we draft these plans, they're very clear that you have to be in continuous service um, with the company upon a change in control. It just is very, it's a very clean, we've seen it before where it's just a, basically a walk away, um, mm -hmm. you know, whereas with a, with a true equity ownership, it could really drag on uh, if there is an argument, you know, with valuation or payout. Yeah, and as it grows in value and, and the parties understand that if, if the employee leaves, it's a true walk away. It's really tough for that employee. Mm -hmm. to, it's a huge decision. I mean, sometimes you have these very creative people in some of these tech companies we represent um, that want to do their own thing. You know, they may be under non-compete, but they have a completely different idea that's not subject to the non-compete or the non-solicitation. But the value of their non-equity participation rights have gone way up because they've helped, and along with the other employees, grow this thing um maybe five five or ten times um and if they quit they have to walk away from that it's a great motivator mm -hmm. to stay mm -hmm. moving into the how and the when so these are kind of the uh, some details as to how the plan is structured and then also what as a business owner you'd want to consider when designing the plan uh, first and foremost is really the participant eligibility criteria. You want to figure out who you want to incentivize and how you're going to get them to stay around. Um, you know, sometimes eligibility is based on tenure. If you um, have certain, certain long-term employees that you want to reward uh, for their prior service and also you want to motivate to keep them going forward, um, it could be full or part-time. Um, the eligibility could be based on metrics and performance-based goals meeting growth targets and also again position um, again there's there's probably you know a huge variation as to what the eligibility criteria could be uh, the important thing is is that it's it's uniform um, you don't want to give somebody particular treatment particularly if it's a, under a plan the plan is going to be the the document and then the uh, the participants are just going to add on well it's interesting among among the participants of that particular plan they all just sign that same plan right. document so it's just a question of how much you're going to give each one. There's no requirement, as long as this avoids the ERISA and tax rules, which it typically does, um, that can be voided, to, for everyone to right. be under the same plan. You could have an executive plan. You could have a mid-management plan. You can have as many, kind of as many as you like. Um, they're non-qualified plans, which means, you, you know, it's just treated as compensation, but basically. Um, but... That may be further, you know, we, we haven't done a lot of graduated plans. We've done a few, um, but that it's further incentive for someone to stay because they can enter the plan for the higher mm -hmm. level management position and still keep their old uh, benefits. Something to think about. The plan would also establish a plan committee and um, we typically, we would like to avoid ambiguity wherever possible so either the people who are administering the plan should be identified in the document um, either by name or by position and we would also want to explain in the document uh, how the committee is appointed 
Um, again, usually the plan committees, the founding members mm -hmm. or upper level management who have been around for a long time. Um, and these are the people who make the decisions as to who to grant the awards to um, and uh, various logistics of the plan administration. It depends on the size of the business. It does. It could be one person. I mean, it could well, be, it, you know, sometimes we typically want more. Input, management but, and right. owners have kind of gotten a few layers between them and people who are hired new, you know, new hires. If it's, let's say there's five or four or 500 employees, the owners of the, of the company aren't going to be aware of, of everybody who's hired. And you may have an administrator at that level to incentivize people. Um, we recently had a deal where uh, our, our client was approached by a private equity suitor and the client had already had a plan in place or they had already discussed the plan with the participants. And one of the concerns that the, the PE suitor had was capping um, participation because from their perspective, again, we talked about the dilution issue previously, is like e even though they're not diluted from a voting or a management perspective standpoint, there is a practical dilution of the economic benefit of the true equity holders. So uh, sometimes in plans, we will build in a cap, either a cap on the individual participant level to ensure that, you know, somebody can't take the lion's share uh, of the phantom units or the EAR units that are available for issuance um, or an aggregate cap. And the aggregate cap issue is what came up in, in the deal is, is the suitor did not, they wanted some assurance that they would not be diluted more than a certain percentage. Well, on this, on that deal, we had a partial by him, mm -hmm. right? So the partial owner is getting, let's say 25% of the company and they're putting up, you know, uh, let's say $20 million, 20% of the company. The last thing they want is for the owner to start issuing excessive uh, ear or phantom units because it will, it will dilute them. Um, and another reason for the cap in that context is um, what, what ended up happening was, you know, they had a plan in place and maybe the, the cap was a, a little too high and so it gets very complicated because now if there's issuances of further um, non-equity participation, it only dilutes the existing owner. So the new investor, you know, has a different class of impact associated with new issuances of phantom units. Does that blow the, the current S election? Does that change things tax-wise? Is that a problem from a regulatory standpoint? It becomes very complicated. Um, so you just, the idea I think with Catherine's alluding to is, you know, when you go into this, go into it with a lot of flexibility, allow for certain revisions of the plan, capping of the plan, et cetera, so that you don't scare away a potential mm -hmm. investor or lender really. And we were able to work a, we had a workaround that was something that was palatable to both sides. So it ended up being fine. Um, but that's just an issue to be aware of. Again, looking long term because the, the key is uh, working towards that change in control, the big, the big uh, payoff at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, vesting and forfeiture, these are issues, uh, you, you know, we talked earlier about a clean break and Gary had mentioned that with, with savvier, participants, they may not want to forfeit or be subject to forfeiture if they're not terminated for cause. And we'll get to that later. But uh, the vesting schedule here, we talk, we give some examples of how to set up some of the vesting. Um, you know, they could be incremental where they get, you know, a piece of the award every year, they complete a year of service. Uh, it could be an all or nothing where they have to stick around for a minimum amount of time to receive any benefit. Um, in, a, in deals where we have participants who've already been with the company for a long time, the plan document could be written such that they get credit mm -hmm. uh, for the time that they have worked for the company before the adoption of the plan. So again, a lot of flexibility in creating vesting schedules. Uh, here, um, again, the plan could be designed so awards even after they vested could be subject to forfeiture upon separation of service. Uh, from the employees, pers from the employer's perspective, um, 
you want as clean of a break as possible. However, from the employee's perspective, they may, they may, it may not be palatable to them to be dismissed without cause and then, and then lose a potentially big payday at the end that they've worked so hard to, to um, achieve for the company. So uh, these are, again, they're variations, again, that the kind of theme is we've got a lot of flexibility with these plans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sometimes vesting can be um, practically it can be practically difficult to enforce if it's too long. So you have to be very careful with vesting. In other words, if someone's really put the time in and then there's a change of control mm -hmm. event before they're fully vested, because vesting can occur mm -hmm. over time, as Catherine said, like you can vest in 10% a year or whatever, or you can just, okay, if you're there for three years, you're completely vested, but you're not vested at all before the three years and there's a change of control um, you can typically expect employees to scream to scream out if uh, you have a big um, liquidation event. They're involved. They're still in the plan. They haven't done anything to cause a forecast uh, termination, but they're you know they're two weeks from vesting. You typically want to settle those matters. And then sometimes we treat those you know from a proactive standpoint in the document where you could have language that accelerates the vesting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so if you have a, a incremental vesting situation let's say it's a five-year uh, horizon and there's a change in control in three, the document could be written such that if the employee is still in good standing and eligible, that last 20% would vest as of the closing or immediately prior to the change in control. So there are ways to um, address those concerns. Here, uh, a variation of the forfeiture is, is for the employee to only forfeit for cause. Um, one of the key things here, if you decide to, to use a four cost standard for forfeiture, is to really clearly define cause either in the plan itself or under the written employment or service agreement between the company and the participant. Um, from the employee's perspective, if they are terminated um, right before a change in control event, they, they, they will scream and say they were sure. closed out. <laughs> it well, was arbitrary. Not, you can't do that. We don't want to do that. So. Uh, to avoid the allegation, um, you want to clearly state in the documents what constitutes cause, and then also document instances if there are performance issues um, that would give rise to cause to make sure that's clearly documented in personnel files. Okay. Uh, and the clean break concept, again, we, we talked about it earlier, is to, to contrast it with a true equity holder. Uh, a termination of services is not automatically trigger a forfeiture or a buyout of a true equity holder. The owner is still an owner even if they're not an employee of the company. So the way we address this on the true equity side is to make sure, again, the employment and services agreements are clear as to the grounds for termination and um, the operating agreement that is entered into by the true equity holder in the company would set forth uh, buyout triggers payment price and terms, valuation, we typically have a valuation formula in there to help avoid uh, arguments. Um, and again, clarity in the documents is key, whether it's a true equity holder or a phantom. And these are the issues that you avoid right. with the phantom or the ear. Um, the recovery of equity is totally, has a, is a totally different process than, than the evaporation of a phantom stock right. If someone leaves or there's you know, clearly a for cause or whatever the trigger is to end the phantom stock right, um, it's kind of just move on.com, change, change the uh, unit, this phantom unit journal we like people to keep, um, take the person out of the records, and there's really no, there's really no notice requirements. It's really, it's really very straightforward. Whereas on the flip side, if you're actually going to issue equity, um, you have to have a transaction. You have to buy the person out. Um, that can, that's got its, you know, it triggers the shareholder and, and, and owner slash member rights with respect to accountings. And did you give me what I was, what, you know, what I had bargained for? That's not what it says. There, there's a tremendous amount of uh, restrictions on the uh, company, and it's usually a, it can be a two mm -hmm. or three month process, honestly. <laughs> Whereas you avoid all that with the with the phantom. That's why we are giving the seminar. We, it's become very very popular. 
because of the practical, the practicality of it. And the buyout mechanics aside, I mean, there could be, if they're leaving on not so great terms, it, should, it could get very emotional. Um, and so we see that where even if the documents are clear, there's emotional turmoil. Yeah, and, and <laughs> let's say there's emotion um, and there's some right. ambiguity. I mean, basically what's going to happen is you, you've got a personal injury case on your hands where, where a, an attorney comes in, a plaintiff's attorney comes in and says, no, 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 it doesn't say this. We think it says that. Um, we're going to tie you up now. It's going to be 60 days. It's going to cost you twenty five to $40,000 in litigation each, each month. So we want 80,000. And let me tell you, you will be so excited to cut them a check for them to go away. You, 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 you will not get to the checkbook fast enough because it's so, it's such a draining, exhaustive process of litigation. None of that is an issue with the generally, I mean, almost never yeah. with the phantom. And you got a business to run. So really, you know, and you got other things, you got to, other do. things to do. <laughs> and fight with somebody who's on their way out. So um, the, the, uh, the equity alternative plan is really, it streamlines that whole exit process. Okay, up until now we've discussed concepts uh, and features that apply to both types of equity alternative plans, the Phantom plan and the EAR plan. We're going to touch on now some of the differences between these two types of plans and um, Really, the key difference is what the participant is going to be permitted to to share in upon a change in control. So what the equity appreciation rights plan, um, the employee or the participant would really just benefit from the growth. Uh, part of the plan mechanics is to establish a baseline so you, you determine um, where your starting point is. And uh, here, you know, the really the best practices are to obtain evaluation by an mm -hmm. expert who is experienced in valuing the type of business or the industry. Um, the EAR plan, as far as motivation, is really um, better equipped to motivate for growth um, rather than retention. I mean, it helps with the retention as well, but if you think about it, if, if the benefit of the plan is based on growth, if um, the company is in constant decline. Um, there's oh, yeah, not that's really, not going to help. <laughs> there's not really a, an element of a incentive point. there. So the EAR plan is really if, if you see your company is on a growth trajectory, you don't want to. <laughs> um, that's that's probably more appropriate for you than. than well, it's plan. probably for people who would be involved right. in that growth. Right. You know, even on a mid, a, a short to midterm mm -hmm. trajectory toward a change in control. We have a question. Um, is the payout to participants always treated as ordinary income? Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. So that that's your that's your comparison study. The only, I mean, one of the only reasons that you still have actual stock options and and equity issuances to non, you know, kind of non control party um, employees is because. If you can, if you want to go through the cost and time of creating a qualified stock option plan, and of course the the maintenance of that plan is, mm -hmm. is fairly expensive, if you, then upon exercise of the option by the employee, it's capital gains. It's taxed as a capital gain. So that's that's why that's the advantage of the of the true stock option plan. Typically, what we're finding over the years is we've done a number of those. It's just a little too encumbered for a small to mid-sized business. It's just a little too much to deal with. Now, if you're publicly traded or you're very large and you can devote a block of time and money to a, a qualified stock option plan, it may be worth it. It may be worth it because the, the the actual benefit to the employee is substantial. There, it's been it was abused in prior years by key owners in public companies. Um, so they, there are restrictions on how much stock stock options, how many you can have if you're an insider. But beyond that, it, it can be very interesting and very beneficial uh, to 
in, with respect to a very large company because the employees really can benefit by that. It's typically not only triggered on change of control that, you know, option can, option occurs typically on termination. Uh, option can occur after a period of vesting where people cash in and out all the time. It's usually a huge amount of people. There's a journal. Uh, there's a day-to-day -day valuation. It's much more complicated. For the smaller mid-size, this is, we found that this is much easier to deal with. Uh, in contrast with the EAR plan, the Phantom plan is a full value award. Uh, here, if, uh, if the objective is to motivate retention, um, you know, whether or not there's an increase or decrease in the value, the participant will receive some value if he or she remains with the company through a change in control event. So if your company is kind of stabilized or plateaued, this could still pro provide some incentive for the people with the, the value and the knowledge to hang on um, for the long haul. Uh, when? When does the company have to pay the participants? I, again, this is a change in control. Commonly, it's upon a change in control. Less frequently, we see uh, payment to participants as and when distributions or dividends are paid to the true equity holders. But by and large, uh, my experience has been um, to incentivize personnel to stay on until the big uh, sale at the end of the day. Uh, the definition of change in control can be as broad or as narrow as the company wants. Typically, we're asked to define a change in control narrowly to include a sale of the whole business to an unrelated third party. So uh, in this slide, you'll see A through D, and there's a continuation on the next slide. These are the types of transactions that typically would not be a change in control. Uh, what you'll notice is that this is all internal things that aren't really organic growth, so a redemption of the company's buying back equity from members that wouldn't trigger a payout or change in control. A recap, again, we had discussed earlier uh, a deal we had with a recap and a partial uh, a minority investor coming in. Uh, we would actually write the document to expressly um, exclude a recap as a change in control event just to avoid any kind of confusion um, or misunderstanding. Uh, cross purchases among existing equity holders, again, that doesn't really it's not growth. Um, there's money changing hands, but it isn't a, uh, a growth or um, event. Um, and then a sale of a line of business. And again, this one, you could you could write the plan. So if you want to incentivize people who are within a particular line of business, you could write it a, as a trigger of a change in control upon the sale of that line. But generally speaking, we're looking at a sale of the whole company. Um, as yeah, as, as what I think Catherine kind of did a good job parsing these out, um, there, the, the effect of the document is to basically be when everybody cashes out, you know, you, you, if you merge with, with another group, that may be a change of control right. that, that triggers this, but typically, um, we don't want to create, we don't want to trigger the payout obligation unless everyone's getting a lot of cash and that kind of governs the, the tenure of the whole document. Um, one of the things that we've asked to design before is the plan that um, would trigger a payout only if the transaction was sufficiently large and this, this kind of threshold value is already built into an EAR plan. Um, but not necessarily in a phantom plan. So if you uh, have a phantom plan and you want to make sure that the transaction is is something that's going to make people a lot of money, um, you want to build in that that transaction value threshold. Um, one of the more intricate pieces of these plan documents is the valuation language that we prepare uh, as far as setting forth a valuation method. Um, one of the things to consider is whether when you have a deal, you know, there's going to be taxes and transaction costs and are those costs to be netted out from the proceeds um, for purposes of valuing the payment to the participants and from the uh, equity owner's perspective, the answer is yes, because they're the ones that are going to be shouldering the, the transaction costs and things, um, the expenses of getting to the sale. So we typically would write in some language um, that the phantom 
or the EAR participants would receive payment net of those transaction costs. Wow, are we on time? Okay, so slide, this is a uh, kind of our, <laughs> our closing yeah, remarks. <laughs> our closing remarks here. Uh, Takeaway, Phantom and EAR are, are not true equity, uh, but the value of the award is tied to the value of the underlying true equity. And I had a deal where um, we had to kind of go over this a few times with the other council because there was a little bit of confusion as to the nature of these plans. But again, uh, the key is, um, when we are dealing with uh, a third party, like a, a potential investor coming in, they're going to be concerned about dilution and their economic um, rights. So here, um, B3, we actually had this um, in place on a prior deal where when someone's buying into a company that has a phantom plan, um, we would recommend that there be a written acknowledgement by the investor. Uh, just, you know, and, and disclosing the terms of the plan so they can't later come back mm -hmm. and say there was some kind of uh, uh, obfuscation going on. So um, the acknowledgement is simply uh, they're going to acknowledge they received the plan and then the payment um, to the plan participants could result in an economic dilution of what they may otherwise receive um, upon a change in control. Um, the same would apply uh, in, a, in a deal where maybe the seller takes role over equity in the buyer entity. So there's all, a lot of variations to this, but again, I think disclosure is key. That way everyone's communicating and understands uh, the potential impact of the plan um, long-term. We have another question. Uh, are there any restrictions on original owners taking operating distributions out of the company if the company has phantom stock plan? No, I don't know. Uh, there's well, there's two there's two issues that go on with these phantom plans. So, one is does the employee receive a percentage of the profits? So on some on some phantom deals, you actually keep a share journal, and when someone's issued a percentage of phantom, they're really economically in the same boat as someone who holds a percentage of real equity. Um, so what does that mean? Well, what that means is we talked about shareholder rights, LLC rights, partnership rights. The common problem is that the, the person who's running the show pulls out a lot of salary, right? They may own 30% or they may own 51% if they're, in, if they're in control. Um, and that salary draws down the profits of the company and the people waiting for their distribution are, are basically disappointed with the size of their distribution. That's when the shareholder rights come into play. That's why they're written. So you basically the shareholders then have the right to basically audit the books to figure out number one, well, is, is, was this correct? And number two, is that a reasonable salary? Now we get into reasonable. What is, what's the definition of reasonable? Litigation is the definition of reasonable. So the, so you can have a phantom that actually has, includes a percentage of profits. T typically it's taxable profits, but that doesn't mean you're not going to get sued by a phantom holder for taking too much salary. They'll have less uh, rights to, to find out information but they can, they can sue you for drawing down their distribution. We found, you know, in the, in, in the days here of private equity and, and the tech and the new tech boom, um, that the, the phantom equity and the ear are basically used for the change of control event. So you have the event, basically up until the event, the, 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 the owners, the real owners of equity, they keep all the profits. They can take whatever salaries they want. They can do whatever they want. Only if there's a sale or, you know, what we refer to as a change of control, do the phantom people get paid. The relationship between distributions and profits and salaries and what they're paid, you know, on a payout of a change of control, is there, is, it makes it very indirect. There's not really a claim. You took too much salary at that point. You have to be very careful with that salary issue, but yes, you can include it in the phantom plan. 
hope that answers that question. I kind of went around the block a little. Um, do we have any other questions, Tony? Yes, we have one other question. Someone's asking if um, the webinar is being recorded. Yes, it is. You'll receive a, an email um, after the uh, event, and there'll be a link in there to the webinar where you can re-listen to it. Okay. That's all so I have. That's if, all if you have. Has, that's all we have. If anyone else has a question, um, please uh, post it now. No, I think that's all we have, Gary. Okay. All right. Well, we, we appreciate you listening and, and asking questions. We remain available. Um, we always would like people to call us. We, our names here, Catherine and Gary, um, with any questions that you have or any other corporate tax or international matters or medi medical uh, health law matters for that matter. Um, this is how we get business. It is not, it is not an encumbrance or a bother to us at all. Um, and we will sign off for uh, Catherine. It's Gary Forster. Uh, Tony, thanks so much for organizing this. Hey, thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye.